On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Avery, and Avery was married to a crazy-making abuser. It's a story of black and white thinking, lies, infidelity, triangulation, circular conversations, hoping for change, shame, and post-separation abuse. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Avery. How are you? I'm great. Thanks. Well, thank you for being here with us today. And before we start today's story, Avery's story, I get a lot of people asking me how the show got started. And the truth is, I kind of stumbled upon it when a friend and I sat down and she started telling me about the abusive relationship that she went through. We hit the record button and put it out into the world. And then someone emailed me and said that it helped them. And from there, we started getting messages from others who had been through similar things and wanted to share their stories to help others too. This show has become a platform for Survivor Voices, and it's become a community. We help validate and learn and grow, and we also talk about things that society really isn't taking a look at, what they don't want to look at. And now this show needs your support as we navigate how to keep these things going and growing. And we're a community now, and we want to make sure that these stories keep getting out there and that the safe support network that includes our online support group can keep running and growing. And to make sure of this, you know, ads are a big part of this world. And we just really want to make sure that the ads that we have line up with the needs and interests of you, our community of listeners into survivors. So if you love the show and want to support what it does, you can do so by filling out this survey now that is in our show notes and you can share it with anyone who you think should take it to. And once again, the link for this survey is in our show notes and I thank you in advance for doing so. And now after saying all of that, I'm going to get out of my way and your way. Thank you, Avery, for being here. The floor is now yours. Um, I was born uh, to two teenage people, two teenage parents. Uh, my mom was 16 when she found out she was pregnant and my father had a uh, taken off to enlist in the Navy by the time she realized she was pregnant. So they had a shotgun wedding about six months before I was born. And we lived, you know, they were both from California. We moved to Charleston, South Carolina to live near the base. Um, my parents were married for, I think, I think they divorced when I was three. And my dad was an alcoholic and not very reliable. Uh, my mom was really young and pretty much on her own in a trailer park just outside of Charleston. We moved back to California, I think when I was just over a year old, lived with some family for a little while. And then after the divorce, you know, my mom was completely on her own. Um, she ended up remarrying right before I turned five. So I, and they were married for, I think, 30 years. So I have two siblings. I had, you know, I was a child of divorce, but I had a nuclear family as well. So it was kind of a, a mix that way. My biological father was not in the picture. He was a little bit when I was very little. My my mother told me much later, she she let me, you know, form my own opinions of my father. And then as an adult, we had some conversations. But there was a lot of saying he would be there and not showing up, um, that sort of thing, which I saw play out, you know, in my sort of tween and early teen years. I think the last time I actually visited with him was when I was about 11. And then at 19, he reached out um, to see me 
And then when I got there, it turned out it was, it was step nine of AA. So it was, it was, you know, just to make amends. And then he never reached out again after that. So he, he's been out of the picture. I did have, you know, a father in my life, but still had that sort of, you know, in and out absent father. Uh, my mother, you know, I, when, when she was 50, she had what we called her first mental break. So we didn't really realize my mom had a mental illness. It, she, she had a really epic set of manic episodes, uh, at 50 and 51. But looking back, I can definitely see that, that she was, you know, sort of low cycling, uh, bipolar. And as a three-year-old, I could get up and make my own breakfast, um, and do that stuff. And for many years, the lore was that that was, you know, I was so independent and I was, you know, really able to take care of myself. And then looking back after, through this process of healing from abuse, it's really become clear that there probably was some, you know, level of neglect that my mom was young and, you know, divorced and couldn't pay all of her bills, you know, on a full-time job and probably was cycling into depressions and all of that. I, my therapist, uh, maybe a year out of the abusive relationship, uh, that's most recent. She said, you know, that that is probably part of why I normalize certain behaviors, right? I knew they weren't really okay, but it, it was still sort of something people who love you or you love sometimes do. So let's say high school version of you. Who are you? What do you like? Just paint us a picture of, I guess, your life, maybe your view on relationships and how you viewed yourself in the world. And if there were any kind of issues that you would notice at this time, but as far as uh, who you are as a whole at this time, just paint us a picture. Uh, high school. High school is actually when I um, stopped trying to make my parents happy, which caused a lot of friction, a lot. Um, my Actually, my eighth grade school picture, I was just uh, thinking about this, is the last one my mother put up in the house because... I was wearing sort of trendy clothes and had cute little earrings and cute hair and all of that. And then for ninth grade, which was when high school started for me, I started wearing all black and just decided to, you know, not, not try to fit that role and started hanging out with, you know, what I guess today would be called, um, sort of goth or emo. Um, you know, all my friends were either punk or metal heads. Like it was just sort of the misfit. Um, crew that the rest of the school called us the burnouts. Um, it was back in the day when schools had smoking sections. And so I didn't smoke, but all my friends did. So I don't know that anybody in high school would believe me that I didn't. Um, so I was, I was kind of angry and sad and, um, I had always been, ahead in school like you know teachers would give me I was in like a you know a school they opened for you know what they used to call gifted and talented education um and teachers would give me extra work so I wouldn't you know get bored in class when I would finish something um high school I just really decided I didn't want to work hard so I just took normal you know the regular classes and started ditching school and drinking um I, I, you know, dabbled a little bit in drugs. I had friends who went really hardcore that way. Um, but I sobered up at like 15, uh, because my mom really got on me and made friends with the attendance office and made it really impossible for me to, to keep it up. Um, and then I, you know, then I just sort of skated with my friends, you know, skated by. Um, I decided I was going to do community college because I didn't have to work very hard and I didn't have to take AP classes and I didn't do any of that. Um, got a job at 16 and worked retail, you know, 30 hours a week on top of 
school because I could then have, you know, even more independence and have a car and, and do all of that. I didn't, um, I didn't date a lot in high school. In my freshman year, I dated a senior. No, I'm sorry. He, I dated him in my sophomore year, so he was out of high school. And then I realized he was in a gang very oddly as he made me duck in a car as we were driving around. Um, I lived in an area of town that had a high gang activity. And so, you know, I ended that with him. And and then I don't think I had a boyfriend again till my senior year. Like, I just um, was more focused on my friends and sometimes getting drunk. <laughs> you know, at a really young age. So, yeah. So what were your twenties like? Uh, my twenties, you know, I, when I started community college, I got really focused and I still, you know, goofed around with friends, but I, I really buckled down and transferred. Uh, I grew up in the central Valley in California in a rural town and I didn't like the, the climate socially, the weather, any of it. I didn't like any of it. And so I, I transferred out of there after two years to San Francisco state. And I realized after I got kicked out of the seat, the California state university system, because I enrolled for three semesters and quit going three semesters in a row without dropping or anything that I'd really buckled down because I wanted out and I got out. And then I didn't have that same motivation then to like, you know, the first two weeks of a class at college could be exciting because it's like a fresh start and maybe a topic you're interested in by that point. But I didn't really want to do that. So I, you know, was just working for a while. I moved back home to go back to school and finish a couple years later and ended up getting into um, deciding to stay longer to do an MFA in writing. And so at that point, I really felt like I'd kind of found, you know, a purpose. Like, I didn't know if I was going to make a career out of it. That wasn't really the goal, but it was, it was just this world where I suddenly felt like I, I fit, I wanted to be. Um, I met a woman in college before, while I was still finishing my bachelor's and fell madly in love with her. We were together for 13 years. Um, I lost my family over that. So, you know, my, my parents were not okay with that. And once I drew a line that, you know, we either had to both be invited to family events or, you know, we were just going to make our own tradition. So I think at 23, um, you know, I was pretty much on my own in a graduate program with, with her and we were living together. And that was the bulk of my twenties was working on that degree and then getting the hell out of town again to move to Portland, Oregon. Um, so we, we moved to Portland. Um, we were there as a couple, almost 10 years. Um, it was a, it was a good relationship. It, you know, had its ups and downs. And of course it didn't, you know, go longer than it did, but it, you know, it, it was an anchor later when I got into the abusive relationship, because I knew what a, what a respectful relationship should be like. Um, I knew I could do that. So to a certain degree, I had a little bit of Teflon as far as, you know, things always being my fault, because I knew that I'd grown up a lot in that relationship. Um, Towards the end of my years in Portland is when my mom's mental health became a really big um, issue in the family. And so when I, when, when we ended the relationship, I, my original plan was to stay in Oregon. Um, and then I decided I needed to move back to California to be closer to family. I had a sister who'd been in and out of rehab. And then my mom was sort of in and out of mental health holds and had actually gone to jail for a little while. So I moved back to California and having just ended that relationship that had been, you know, from mid from my early twenties to my mid thirties, like I really was trying to figure out who I was, who I was all by myself because that relationship had been so central to, to everything. Um, you know, who I was in the context of this family, like my family had come back into my life after about five years of not talking to me. And so I, I can look back in hindsight and see that I really forgave a lot of 
how they operate or how they may have treated me because I was, I, I just really wanted my family to be back. I just really wanted to have everything, um, you know, that sort of happy ending, right? Of like them coming around, everything being okay. Um, but when I moved back to California, it was, there was a lot of chaos right before I moved back. My, my mother had taken over the family home and had kicked my father out maybe a, you know, a couple of years before she had started renting rooms out and had like squatters. She had, it, it was a really beautiful older home on like a quarter acre. And she had people there that like the police department wouldn't send one officer in to go see, like, I mean, some pretty dangerous like folks were there and we'd lost contact with her, but there had been a murder in the house. And so that the aftermath of that, my mom, we didn't know at the time, but we figured out she had moved out before that happened because I think it got out of her control, the the sort of situation of squatters and and people like people living there had put like these like three locks on a bedroom door because I think whoever else was living there was pretty sketchy. Um so when I moved back, that was that had all just happened. Um, We knew my mom was okay, but we didn't really know where she was at. My sister and I got taxed because she was newly out of rehab and I had just relocated and didn't yet have a job um, with cleaning up the house, which was a really, I mean, to this day, it stands as one of the most like difficult couple weeks of my life. It was, you know, lots of disgusting stuff left all over the house on top of, you know, fingerprint um, dust everywhere to clean up. And we were trying to salvage family memories that were like literally like thrown around or tucked in like weird crawl spaces of the the closets. Um, I was also trying to maintain a long distance relationship with someone I had started dating after the long-term relationship broke up. And, and he was looking back, I think if I hadn't had distance, um, I may not have seen it as clearly, but he was really controlling And I would have these days in this house and I would be like exhausted in every sense you can be exhausted. I was just like beat and I would get back to um, my, I was staying at my sister's house and I would take a shower and try to wash all the like disgust off from the mess of that house. And, you know, we would either talk on the phone or, or he would want to chat on the computer and, and he would he would say things like I I didn't sound excited enough to speak to him. And like, I should, I should, you know, have more excitement in my voice. And it's like, really? Like, (laughs) I think, you know, maybe because uh, we, we had, you know, hundreds of miles between us, I could clearly see that as like, that's no, like, you know, exactly what I'm doing. You know, exactly what the weight of all of this is emotionally. And like, I'm, talking to you like that's that should be enough right at this point um I'm using what little energy I have to do that so I so I ended that and it was interesting because he he drove down from Oregon like and and sort of held me hostage in my car at one point saying he was just going to turn around and leave if I didn't say we could still be together and you know odd things like that and I I didn't say that and then he you know I just sort of he stayed. And then when he left, it was like, yeah, we're still not together. But, um, so after all of that, I decided I wasn't going to date at all. I said, I clearly, there's a lot of like chaos that's been happening and I need to make sure that I'm healed. So I actually didn't date anybody for almost a year. And I, I did a lot of writing. I did, um, I took some time off around New Year's um, of 2011, and or it was going to be 2012. And I I made paper boats out of origami paper and did this ritual where I wrote on them like all the things I needed to let go that had to do with you know my mom or relationships or um, things like that. And I went on New Year's Day and released them to the you know out into the ocean, went to the beach, and then met up with some friends. And you know I was really um, intentional about trying to make sure that before I got into another relationship that I, I, I was 
in a good headspace. I was clear. Um, I was, you know, healed from mourning sort of all these things that had just come up, you know, in the last five years of my life. Um, and then once I decided I was ready to date, then, um, then the abuser showed up. <laughs> so walk us through uh, the meeting of, of where you met this person and how they, you know, became a, a big part of your life. I, um, so I was, you know, relatively new back to the state. I had made, most of my friends were, were not in the immediate area, but I had made a couple new friends, um, through some longtime friends. And so, um, as became a pattern, I sort of gave trust to those new acquaintances because they were attached to people I trusted. Um, and, and those two women, uh, dragged me out to go, to go see a, a punk band play. One of, one of the women, she was the one I was hanging out with the most. We drove over there mostly because we needed to give another friend of hers a ride home from the show. But she kept going, just come with me, just come with me, just come with me. And this friend was sober. So, you know, when we went, like, I didn't drink. I just, we both were just drinking water. I'm um, watching. Supposedly there was like the woman we were going to give a ride home to. Some woman was going to show up there and was threatening to like beat her up. And I remember just being like, I am way too old for this. Like, why am I still here making jokes about how I'm going to, you know, have a rubber band on my wrist to pull my hair back if things get weird. But I, I had been in the, you know, I had attended a lot of events and been sort of, you know, auxiliary to the punk scene back home when I was much younger. And so it kind of felt fun at the time to be back in that world. And, and I love music. And so, you know, seeing small shows and seeing bands play and that energy, um, it, it was fun. We, we were there and it turns out the person who had given her a ride, um, the girl we were supposed, the woman we were supposed to pick it, pick up and give a ride home had, was him. So he had given her a ride there, but she wanted us to give her a ride home. So I got introduced by these two new friends to him. And he, he, he like asked one of them, like, who's your hot friend? Introduce me. Like he was just really like over the top, like pursuing, um, you know, he came and stood, stood by me while one of the bands was playing and was, I don't even remember what he was saying, but I remember making shoveling motions and like flipping, you know, pretending to flip the shovel over my shoulder, like, and rolling my eyes and being like, you know, you're okay. Okay. Those are some good lines, like, you know, whatever. But, you know, he was entertaining me, but I wasn't, I wasn't into him at all. Um, and then we were going to drive back to the town we lived in and then go get a beer where we could just have a beer and walk home. Um, and he was going to meet us there and he didn't show up. And I remember I was actually relieved because then it was just the three, you know, us three friends like hanging out, but he did a uh, friend request me like probably before he passed out that night on Facebook. And then the next day was messaging, um, about hanging out or about going out. And I told him, I said, you know, if you want to hang out as friends, that's fine, but I'm not, I'm not interested in dating right now, which wasn't really the truth, but I just, you know, I, I was just like, I don't know that I even like you or anything, but maybe, you know, you're making me laugh a little bit. Um, and it's interesting because that night I actually had a bunch of girlfriends even coming from out of town and we were doing this like, party we'd been planning for a long time and he he kept saying he was going to show up when we were at this bar across the street and I was like no you're not <laughs> like no this is my girlfriend's I'm not going to be that woman like no way no no but it was interesting because I I kind of glossed over that like he invited me to like a family baby shower that night and then was saying he was going to crash you know my party and um in hindsight I'm like that's that's creepy like why <laughs> Like, why did I think it was funny? Um, but, you know, I, I had 
I was putting up boundaries and he, you know, he would, he would respect those, it seemed. And, um, he, you know, we just, he had his son 50% of the time. So he was going to have him the whole next week. Um, so we weren't going to hang out because he was going to have his son. Um, and in that week he was constantly texting me and he was funny. He was witty. Um, I was looking forward to the text. It was, you know, cause I would, it was really making me laugh and it was kind of fun, you know, after so long of intentionally just withdrawing from the dating world to have somebody that interested was really, um, it felt good. Like, and so my Achilles heel has always been, if somebody can make me laugh, then they become far more attractive than they did, you know, before I knew they could make me laugh. So I, I, I often wonder if we had actually just hung out in person um, sooner if I would have been hooked as fast because I think that sort of communication really suited love bombing in, you know, that you can just really, you know, he could be doing whatever, but saying constantly all these, you know, funny, nice things. Um, so then we did we hung out, I think, three times the week after that, like had a first date and then ended up hanging out a couple nights before that to meet back in person before because then we were both free. Um, and I had said, like, you know, to my friends, I said, I don't even know if I would want to kiss him. Like, he's making me laugh, but I don't even remember what he looks like at this point. I don't even remember like, I don't know him that much. Like, I don't even know if I would be attracted. And then, you know, by the first time we hung out again, I was like, I was like, yeah, I think, I think I do. I think I like him. Um, but he pursued, you know, really hardcore. And w at the time it didn't feel like things moved that fast. But of course, when I look back, I'm like, of course they moved really fast. Cause we met in mid February and by the end of April, I told him I loved him. He was really, he really was at first, like, um, he really came off very, when it came to like or the romantic relationship part, like very shy, very timid, very like definitely saying what he wanted that he, you know, that he wanted to go out, that he wanted to be with me, but also played this real, like I've been hurt. and. Um, he had a tattoo, actually, I mean, I'm sure he still does, across his chest that said love hurts, or love lies, I'm sorry, love lies, that he got after his first girlfriend broke his heart, supposedly. Um, so, you know, we, I mean, at that point, I think that he he definitely seemed like someone who was straightforward someone who wasn't afraid to have feelings for someone. He also seemed like someone who needed, you know, needed love. And I, you know, I think that I've always sort of had this um, maternal side to me. I have siblings who are quite a bit younger that I helped um, care for a lot and then was always, you know, babysitting and doing things like that. And I think there was this caretaking element, right, of, you know, here's this guy with this broken heart who's, you know, been married and divorced and wishes he could be with his kid more and just really wants to, you know, find love and settle down. And um, he really is that serial, quote unquote, monogamist <laughs> an abuser where he's jumping into long term relationships um, right after each one. So I, I just, you know, it was we had fun. It felt easy compared to the things that had gone on between my previous long-term relationship and then meeting him. He, you know, he was really, really agreeable. And of course, you know, from his perspective, we were soulmates and nobody had ever made him feel this way. And, you know, he would thank me all the time for letting him be himself and you know, and, and of course he was interested in all the things I was interested in. And, you know, I had no idea at that point how many cues, you know, you would give off that 
somebody who's predatory is going to, you know, be really attuned to. So, so it seemed like we were just both, you know, wanting the same things. And, and then we, you know, half the time he, he was just a solo person and I didn't have any kids. And so it was, you know, we could just go out and eat or go out to a show or we could just take off, you know, to Santa Cruz for the weekend, or we could just, you know, it was just this fun. Um, it felt really secure to me at first. So eventually triangulation start to happen. A big one with the woman he dated previously to you and then his ex-wife. So walk us through this. When we were out to dinner and he was telling me that, you know, this one woman that he had dated, um, but he had ended it a month before we met and she was just kind of crazy and psycho and wouldn't let go and kept texting him. And, you know, so if I see any messages from her, that's what that is. But, you know, she knows about me and he's not, he's not interested. And I remember just going, why don't you change your phone number then? Like if somebody won't leave you alone, just like block her or change it. And he goes, Oh no, I've had this phone number forever. And, you know, and it's true. He has, because, you know, it's how he keeps connected to everybody um, in that way. But, and then of course he was, you know, he was setting all of the stones in place to triangulate his ex-wife and I, um, you know, he was acting like, you know, she had cheated on him and, that she really broke his heart and she really fought him about seeing his son and he had to fight really hard for that and that you know she she was really difficult and she wouldn't include him in things and you know really set all that up and then you know eventually I I saw messages that he sent to her about me that even in the beginning were really interesting because it was just kind of like um you know, nitpicking at certain things or just kind of like, he sort of set me up with her to be, he set me up as like the fall guy for anything that was going to happen in our house, you know, that had to do with his son. Um, and looking back in hindsight, I didn't, I met his son faster than I would introduce my daughter to anybody. Um, but the only reason I think it wasn't right away was because of me. And because I made it clear that I, I would, you know, I'm, I think I said things like, oh, I know, you know, I won't meet him right away because we haven't known each other very long, but when I do, or, you know, so he, he kind of tried to play that, um, like it was his decision, which knowing from his ex-wife now, you know, that's not how any of the relationships before went. I mean, he was bringing women around his son all the time. Um, but he, you know, he was setting all of those triangulation stepping stones in place at that time and but you know in the case even of the woman he had been dating who was crazy and psycho and wouldn't let go like you know he just really played it as like woe is me like I'm trying to you know separate from this um but we one of our first big fights was in May so we had just really you know we'd only been together seeing each other for three months we went to a show that his band was playing and that crazy psycho woman quote unquote she showed up with her friends and I was really uncomfortable because I was like I don't think he knows that I know what she looks like right but I did because of course with all of that weirdness he was sort of doing in the beginning I had I had like looked through some of his Facebook just in, in my mind, I was just sort of getting the landscape, right? Like seeing, so I would know if I ran into anybody. We live in a pretty small community. And she showed up and I was like super uncomfortable. And then when I was waiting outside for him, I know when the show was over and it was time to walk home, um, he wasn't coming out. He wasn't coming out. He wasn't coming out. And I finally went in and he was at the bar talking to her and her friends. And I was, I was livid. I was like, what the hell are you doing? Like, you've said this woman is crazy. Like, why are you even encouraging this? Right. But I just walked out and then I, I walked home and he did, he told me, oh, I was just thanking her for behaving. I was like, what? 
like, I remember we, I think we sat outside my apartment. Like I didn't even let him in. And we just argued for like an hour and a half over that. And it was one of the first times um, I can look back and see that, you know, he really, he would, he would outwardly be apologizing that that hurt me, but he also was just flipping it around that it was my fault. And so at that, during that time is when I decided I was going to go to therapy because I was worried that my own issues were going to sink this relationship. And, and, it, and I wasn't even consciously getting yet that he was really subtly pointing me in that direction, that he would flip, you know, every single issue around so that it was like, well, you're just, I don't know why you're so paranoid about this, or I don't know why you can't see that this isn't, you know, maybe it's because of your past, or maybe it's because of all this stuff with your mom, or maybe it's, you know, all of those things. He would seem really concerned um, about that. And I said, okay, well then I'm going to go therapy because I'm going to make sure that like, this isn't my stuff that's going to, you know, derail us. Um, and then I did that. And the therapist, one of the first things she told me was that I was, you know, I was displaying hypervigilance and that made complete sense to me because, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of us who might use the word empath or say that we're really like sensitive or receptive, right. That, you know, we have our antenna, like super tuned. So for whatever reason, right. Whether it was as a child, you know, my mother's moods were just so gently, um, shifting that I was, you know, tuning in for when that would, when that would change or, you know, all the sort of trauma of, what had happened in my family or any of that. And um, so I told him that. And it was one of the first times where I can look back and see something completely weaponized because to me, I came in and I'm like, hey, I have this, I have this word for what's happening. And and from my perspective, it wasn't even that I was seeing things that weren't real. It was a it was it was sort of validation that I'm just really attuned, and so I'm noticing a lot of things, and that's what I kept telling him. I'd be like, "No, what I'm seeing is 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 a thing. Like if you're doing this, but you're saying she's crazy, and you don't want her to contact you, but then you're encouraging her, then then that's a problem. Like that that those things don't match. Those those two things don't go together. Um, or you know there was there was an episode where he threw something as a pumice stone. It's one of the funniest things. And he still tells people, he still tells people this story is why I'm crazy. Um, I had a broken pumice stone. The handle was broken off of it in the bathtub and I was going to just fix it. Um, I like to not throw things away if they can just be fixed. And I went in the bath and it was gone. And I was like, what did I do with that? Like, I worried that I had lost it. I didn't know where it could have gone because why would I take it out of the bathtub? And when I got out of the bath and I threw something away in the garbage, I saw the handle of it peeking out. So he had thrown it away, but covered it up in the garbage. And, and to me, that was the weird part that he didn't say anything. And then he, and then he like hid it in the garbage can. So I was asking him about it and he was like, what is wrong with you? It was, it was just, it was garbage. I'm like, well, that's fine. I mean, I was going to fix it and I could throw it away. I can buy another one, but I don't know why you hid it or why you didn't ask me what, if I still wanted it. And that became like a weeks long, like fight. But it was those things where I was like, no, I'm, I'm hypervigilant, but what I see is still there. Like, that's what I kept trying to come to him as. And he would turn around and go, you're just, you're just you know, you need to stop being so hypervigilant and seeing things that aren't there. And so we would sort of go in a circular argument about that. Um, and in, in hindsight, now that I know that it's, you know, kind of a common thing to hide things and make someone feel like they're kind of losing their mind. I'm like, oh, that makes even more sense now. Like you just, you know, you were just messing with me, like just to have me be confused. You didn't count on me finding it in the garbage can now. And that's where, you know, 
because towards the end, you know, I lost, I lost my keys a lot. And I think in the four years that since I ended the relationship with him, I've lost my keys once, you know, it's that stuff where I'm like, Oh, (laughs) that's what you were doing. Um, but you know, I kept going to, to therapy and, and I, I, looking back, I, I definitely, all the things that were problematic, I would do, you know, that sort of positive projection, right? Like he just doesn't understand, like he, he never got taught how to do this or, you know, like his, he got bounced around a lot as a kid. He got shoved off on a lot of people. His parents weren't always around. Um, and I was like, you don't, you just need to learn that this matters or you need to, you know, understand. And he would, especially in the first year to, to really to two years, he, you know, he was really amenable. Like when we would have conversations about things that bothered me, he would, he would be like, Oh, I'm so sorry. Like, I won't do that anymore. Um, you know, it would seem like a very mature grown up conversation. You know, it turns out he'd never stopped doing anything that hurt me. He just tried to hide it better. But, you know, for the most part, I just really was positively projecting. We did have, there was an episode, wasn't long after the, you know, him talking to the crazy woman at the bar where we went to a a show his band was going to play in a city in the, you know, a little north of us. And supposedly there was some beef happening that had already happened with like some out of town band had like their friends had beat up some friend of his really bad. And so he thought there might be a fight there. And I was like, I don't want to go if there's going to be a fight and none of his friends were coming and he was acting like they were all leaving him alone to deal with this. But during the, before his band was going to play, there was this weird moment where I could tell he was getting really tense and then something happened with the, they got bumped to later in the show and this band that he was so mad at got, got their spot because they had to like drive home out of town. I don't know something, you know, and I didn't know it, but he had disappeared out to his car and he came back in with a bat and he went up and he, he just started swinging at the band on the stage. And I was back in a room where all the, band equipment was um there was only one way out one way in um but one of his friends who was in the band he was at the doorway and I was back sitting on a couch and he just said your man's about to like do something you should come out here but by the time I got out there he was swinging this bat I mean at the people on the stage at the equipment um the whole crowd turned against him and they were all trying to get him to stop and get him out of the, out of the venue. And he was, he was like, you know, the, the sort of, (laughs) the sort of story where you can lift a car with your adrenaline. Like he was just dragging like 50 people around in a circle, like, as they're just trying to get him to the door. And one of his friends jumped in and was trying to get him out the door. And at one point he's bringing the whole crowd towards that room. And I am just like, I don't know what to, like, I'm looking and I'm like, there's like drum symbols here, but I don't, there's nothing I can protect myself with if this like mask comes in here. And I looked at him and his eyes were just black. Like he just had those, those like black eyes. And, and I, you know, when I would look back after we split up, that was one of those moments where I was like, I clearly, I was, I was terrified. I was, you know, full alarm. And then once it got smoothed over, I just like repressed it because thinking of those black eyes was just like not it didn't go with what I knew of him all the other moments we'd been together and so um you know I saw those black eyes a lot after (laughs) I ended it and that's when I was like wow but I remember after that show like you know we a friend got him out to the car and another friend was like dude you have a kid you can't be doing this like you can't go to jail and he was just still like kind of out of it and then this other friend drove us home and he had cuts all over his head and he was, you know, he was kind of a mess. And we were supposed to go out of town the next morning to the beach. And 
the next morning, I just told him, I said, if, if that's the life you want, then go ahead. Like, go have it. But I don't want any part of that life. Like, that is not, like, there's nothing about what you did that I think is, like, funny or cute or none of it. Like, I don't care what those guys did. Like, what you did was, was wrong. Like, that was, you know, you put a lot of people in jeopardy. Like, a lot of people could have been hurt. And, you know, you're just saying it's because the, you know, it was disrespectful. Like, I was like, this is, I don't, I don't like this. Um. But he promised me that that wasn't the life he wanted and he wasn't going to do any of that again. And he really did actually, you know, stay away from a lot of shows. But, you know, in his circle, they were like, for years, people were like high-fiving him. Like, it, it was just this story of like, you know, this kind of epic event or something. And I remember once being with a couple of his male friends at a, sitting at a table at a bar while there was like a street fair happening in our town and these like beer girls came up and were flirting with the guys but at the same time the guys were talking about that night and they were talking about it in this really positive like that was really cool way or like you're such a legend or like something right and I I got really upset and left and later I was I was laughing because I'm like oh man those guys probably think I got mad like because the beer girls were there but really it was like no it was this other thing like why like you guys are all acting like this thing where he just became this you know violent demon you know it was just like so so checked out of any version of him I had known and and so that you know early on that was one of the things that I was like I almost bailed there were you know moments like that there were a few in the first six months where I would back off and say I needed space. And then he would just pursue hardcore. He would just, I don't want to lose this. Like, you know, we're meant to be together. This is the best thing I've ever had. I promise I'll change. So eventually you end up really shifting your life for this person moving in. You do get pregnant and little things start to pile up and they start to pile up. So walk us through this. Um, so, you know, we, he and his son ended up moving in with me at the, basically the one year mark after we met. And, you know, it, it was, it was still like a really fun, happy time for the most part. I can look back and see that I was, you know, being gaslit about certain things or spun around, but for the most part, you know, he was really agreeable. He was definitely still playing the role of, you know, the person who was right for me. Um, and then when his son moved in, it was, I, I love kids. And he was at an age that's one of my favorite. His son was six. Um, he was adorable. Um, and so I really took on, you know, making the weekends fun and making a room for him and doing all of that stuff. And then it really was by the end of that year, like at the time, it didn't seem like we had only been together that long, but by, by close to the two year mark, I had started, you know, wondering, I had decided in my early twenties that I wasn't going to have children partly because a, a close friend's brother had committed suicide and seeing her parents go through that had made me think, yeah, I don't, I don't want to risk it. If that, I don't want to love something that much and then um, feel that much pain. And, you know, he was, he had one child. He said he'd always wanted a lot of children. And I remember talking to my friends about, you know, now that I'm out of this long-term relationship where we had both agreed, we weren't going to have kids. Like now it's just sort of a decision about what do I want? And so I talked to him about it and said, you know, I'm willing, I'm willing to try, like, if you want to, but it would have to be pretty soon because I was, I was turning 40 or had just turned 40. And, um, I didn't really want to do any interventions. I just was like, if it happens, it, it happens. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And so he, he said, yeah, he would like that. Um, and we ended up, getting pregnant really fast, like within a couple months. And 
then I had a miscarriage early and, um, then we tried again. I said, I'll try one more time, but I'm not going to, if, if, you know, we miscarry again, I'm not going to risk a third. Um, and so, you know, just over two years after we got together, I, I was pregnant with our daughter. And during that time, about four or five months into the pregnancy is when I really started to see that something was not okay that something was wrong and that the way that I felt was shifting um, and that these little things were all piling up. Um, and whenever I would bring something up, he, it, it was just the height of those circular word salad conversations where it suddenly he's trying to tell me it's my fault. And, you know, having been in a healthy relationship, I was like, no, this isn't how this goes. Like, I don't, how did we even get here? And by the end of the conversation, I would just be like crying on the floor going, I don't know what, what were we talking about to begin with? Like, I was just so spun around and it's the first time I started to really sort of see contempt him, you know, like, like he had contempt for me when any of these things would come up or if I would hold him accountable for anything, like where he really was just starting to flip and you know, he was less affectionate, less um, positive about us. Um, I remember we were commuting to work together because then he'd he'd managed to get a job at my work. And he, uh, I don't even know what we were fighting about, but I kicked him out of the car, like near the bridge in our town and said, go get your car. Like, I'm done with you. Like, I can't talk to you right now. And and, you know, those are the things where he'd be like, you're so crazy. Like, what's wrong with you? Like, nobody, normal people don't do that. Um, but it was one of the first times I remember being physically, re like, there's a way that my body would just sort of recoil from his energy sometimes. And so I'd have to be further away. Um, you know, by the last trimester, I, I remember being in my room and just like literally crying out loud saying like, what am I bringing a child into? Like, what is this? I don't understand this. Like, because it would be, I'm the best ever. And then it would be like, I'm the worst ever. Like I, I was like this back and forth is just so disorienting. I don't know what to do with this. Um, and so I, I actually told him we needed to go to therapy and so my therapist agreed to see us together. And we did that for a couple months before I gave birth. And, but, you know, not knowing what we were in and then just, you know, the therapist just kind of trying to help us with the situation. It was stuff like, well, maybe can he be the fun parent and you're the rule parent or, you know, it's the stuff. And I'm like, sure, but I don't know. Like I was starting to realize that the way he'd represented his expenses in relation to his son weren't true. I had, I'd been covering all the bills except for splitting rent with him. Um, he was also at that point allowing me to just, I was buying all the groceries. I was buying, you know, all of this stuff where I was like, wait a minute, like I wanted my own account because I don't want to give up, you know, my own independence, but this is, this is bullshit. <laughs> why, why am I paying for all this as our expenses are like climbing um, but when my daughter was born, I just was, I was just in this like euphoric cloud after that. Um, I was so in love with her. I was so in love with this family that we were, you know, that, that I was creating, holding on to like, you know, him, his son, her, me, um, I sort of had like the opposite of any sort of postpartum, like it was hard and I was tired, but I also was just in this like happy cloud of like, look what we made, like, look at, look at how amazing this is. Um, and then a couple months after she was born, he proposed and I said, yes. Um, but I think over the next probably only like eight months after a couple months, I think I wore the ring solid for two or three months. And then everything started to just be worse than it was when I was pregnant. Like his level of contempt for me was climbing. I was getting so annoyed with him because I was doing everything for our daughter. Um, I was buying everything. I was 
the one getting up and, you know, I was breastfeeding. So he would, you know, put it off on that. But I'm like, you literally could give her a bath when you get home from work, but you just sit on your phone or you just, you know, do all these other things. So I, um, I gave him back the ring three times. <laughs> and, um, I think twice I threw it at him and said, when you can convince me that you actually want to get married, then why don't you give it back? Cause I love you and I want to marry you, but this doesn't feel like this is actually what you want. Um, and then he would turn around and, you know, be mad at me and say how disrespectful and rude it was that he spent all that money on that ring and loved me and I'm throwing it at him or, you know, how do I think that feels? And so he had the ring. And then I think that was about the time that I just really felt like something, something was so wrong. One night I just asked him for his phone and I found all these texts between him and his ex-wife bad mouthing me. Um, and then I met with his ex-wife to be like, I see this, like, you know, I was mad at him and having conversations with him about how inappropriate, but then I met with her and set, you know, what to me felt like I was just setting boundaries, but can look back and see, I was just trying to have some kind of control over my life. Cause I, I wasn't going to just walk away because now we had a child. Um, and I didn't want to just dismantle her family. If there was any hope of fixing it, I eventually like three or four months after that found emails where he basically had been having what I think was an emotional affair. I don't think it was very physical. Um, with his very first girlfriend. So they had been having an affair. They'd been having an affair on and off for like 20 years at that point. She was married and had kids. He had been married while he was doing that. And then, you know, was with me. Um, I reached out to her because I didn't, I knew I wasn't going to get the truth from him. And, and I, I made her call me and I sort of tricked her into, you know, confirming or denying certain things, which is why I think it wasn't physical, but, um, I, you know, at that point, the world, like the way that it felt was like, I suddenly a sinkhole had opened up beneath me. Like I felt like everything from my life had just collapsed on top of me. And I was in this deep hole and I didn't know how I was going to dig out of it because I had this child, you know, I loved his son. Um, but I didn't know what to make of. I was like, everything is a lie. I had found an iPad that he had hidden, um, which is actually how I found out about the affair with the other woman. But he bought it from another woman he'd always tried to date and like went and picked it up from her so he could give her a hug. Like he would do those like, like be like that little puppy dog, teddy bear, like, you know, oh, I just need a Rita hug. Like, um, he had a guitar he'd bought and he hadn't told me like, meanwhile, I'm paying for all the bills and complaining to him that, you know, I need some help. And he's acting like he has all these expenses for his son. And, and it, you know, I was able to figure out he'd never paid child support. He'd made it part of his divorce agreement that he never had to pay child support. Um, you know, there were, after the affair, I, like a month after that, I found in his like, photo library he'd been collecting photos of like women that were friends or friends wives or girlfriends and saving like photos off their social media profiles and it was it was like at that point it was like this is like creepy this is it's just like serial killer um archives I don't know like why do you have these and he wouldn't be able to tell me um we had started after I found out about the affair I told him if I was going to stay even one more day that we were going to go to therapy and that, you know, we were going to find somebody new and that he was going to quit. He was going to quit the bands for right now. We were both going to quit social media. We were going to go completely sober so that nothing was a distraction. You know, that, that the main focus had to be saving this family or, or it was just done. Um, and he would always at the 11th hour come around to these things and say, okay, you know, you're the world to me. This family's the world to me. Um, that therapist, he gave us a test, our first or second session that was based on the Gottman 
Institute stuff. And I, I hadn't learned about Gottman before this. And then, you know, since I've looked back at it and thought, wow, I should have just walked out right then. Um, because when we did this test, he, the therapist said, you know, you guys have all four horsemen of the apocalypse. But what I heard then was like, but we can fix that. <laughs> right? We can, there's hope, right? Like there's hope. Um, and now I'm like, wow, I should have just like, I should have just packed my bag and cut my losses right that second. Um, that was a long, I think we started therapy in July or August. And then the very next year in September, we, we split up and it was just a crazy making year because he, he didn't mask really anymore. Just how angry he would get at me. He would, it was that very under the surface, um, contempt, but he would say I could never be happy. And I was just wallowing in my pain. And I was giving him sections of, from books about how to help your partner through like betrayal triggers and like all this stuff. And, and then he would say, well, you're just bringing this on yourself and you just can't get over it. And I'd be like, but if you would just help me when I get triggered, I can't help it, but you could, you could do stuff that would make this heal way faster. And he, he would just refuse. Like, he was like, this is, this is you. Like, this isn't me. I said, I'm sorry. And I won't do it again. And, um, so it was, you know, it was a lot of, a lot of that, a lot of crying into bath towels in the bathroom or in the laundry room, you know, after my daughter went to bed, um, that year felt like just this like daytime trudge of sort of getting through like all the tasks. And then once she would go to bed, just falling apart because it was the first time I could do it. And then him being mad at me and maybe sleeping downstairs for four days because I can't just let it go. And I keep taking it out on him, um, by crying, by being hurt, um, by him still lying about certain little things. And then, you know, of course being triggered by that, um, by driving by a place that they, you know, met up secretly at or something like that. Um, so I thought it was over. I actually met with a lawyer and I met with a paralegal and was looking at what the best way to do it. Cause I did know one of the things I did know from having done a deep dive in his computer and everything was that he was a real jerk to his ex-wife when they split up. And so part of me was very afraid of what was going to happen. Um, so I knew I needed something official for custody. Like I wasn't going to play around. Um, so we even met about, you know, what we thought that would be. And then within three or four weeks, we were back together. Like I was still very trauma bonded. I felt so crushed and like just bone deep sad every time, you know, if he would, he was living, we have sort of a duplex. So he was living in one of the units until he could find somewhere. And every time he would like take both kids off for his time, like I was just broken. I was just like, this is, I can't believe, you know, this is what life is. So I was, you know, I fell prey to sort of his like passive aggressive hoovers of like, you know, I wish we could make this work or I miss you. And so we ended up back together for two more years. Um, and sometimes it felt okay, but mostly it was just that cycle of me being incredibly hypervigilant for signs that he wasn't telling the truth and him getting really angry at me for having any sort of feelings or expectations of him. So, you know, if he, I would always put our daughter to bed and then he would go in the bedroom and he'd be just on his phone or watching football or something. And, and then I'd be like, you know, it'd be nice if you would help, like you could have made her lunch for tomorrow while I was putting her to sleep or, and he'd be like, oh, well, nothing is ever enough. Like I can't, you know, I worked all day too. And, you know, I was working, I was back to work at that point. And I, you know, I'm like, you don't, you don't do anything. Like, I think in three years he made her lunch one time and then he gave her a bath one time, but he didn't do it right. So I had to put her back in the bathtub and like rinse her hair. Um, which I think is that kind of, you know, weaponized incompetence, right? Like, I think he would, 
do things not quite right because then it would just be easier for me to to do them than have them do them wrong and then have a fight and then have days of silent treatment and you know be be so upset um so part of when we got back together part of what I said is I said you you need to do solo therapy I'm not doing couples therapy again until you do solo therapy we had gone to one more couples therapist and he had so played her and I I still wonder what's going was going on with her because she sort of when we met alone, she was sort of encouraging me to, she was encouraging me to go to Al-Anon. She was encouraging me to not, you know, not be so attached to him. But when we were together, she would really play into him. And she like laughed when I started crying once. And so I walked out of the session. Um, and then the next time I tried to explain to her why I had walked out and, you know, I started crying, telling her about her like laughing at me as I cried and rolling her eyes and she did it again. And she looked at him and she said, I'm starting to see the drama now. And I was like, I was livid. I just got up and walked out. So I'm never going to that lady. Um, and I said, you need to go to solo therapy. I'm going to go to Al-Anon because we can't afford two therapists. Um, so you do that. And then he's like, well, I, you should go if I'm going to go. And, you know, and I was like, no, you literally, I said, you don't understand. Like you tell me that me just sharing a feeling with you that I'm attacking you. I said, so clearly there's something happening that you don't, it's not being interpreted the way it's being said. Cause I was measuring, you know, with so after so much therapy and after trying to salvage this, I was so measured about how I would approach him, right? Like anger wasn't allowed. Nothing even remotely close to anger, anger was allowed. So I would do that therapy speak and I would be like, Hey, I'm having this feeling. And I think it's because, you know, when, when you, when you don't tell me about X, Y, or Z, and then I find out later, that's really, it. I mean, I literally would be talking like that. And know that I was calm, monotone. Um, and he would, he would storm out of the room and say I was attacking him and, um, he didn't need to be abused like that. And, you know, all of these things. And so he, he also meanwhile was going to AA because I had, I had told him I wanted him to go to, um, sex and love addicts anonymous meetings, because I could tell, I was like, there's something about a, attention that you, you seem to need at a like really unhealthy level from multiple people. And he was like, no, I'm an alcoholic. And I was like, well, I don't think you're an alcoholic, but if you say that you understand, I will never believe you're not an alcoholic. Right. He's like, yes. So then when it came up in court papers, I was like, you self-identified, like, I don't. So, you know, you did this dude. Um, so he started seeing a, a solo therapist. He started seeing our therapist actually solo. That was the first step. It's every other session was both of us. And then he would go the week, the sessions in between. Um, but then, then he, he stopped and then we almost broke up. It was sort of always a cycle and I would have to give it a deadline because he would say we couldn't afford it. And he would say, you know, he didn't have time because he wanted to be with his family. And I'm like, well, you're not going to have a family like, if you don't do this. And so when he was supposed to be getting a new solo therapist in 2019, and I don't even know what I was, we were having some discussion and then we hadn't talked for about it for a couple hours. I got the, the kids to sleep went in the room and I remember I was just so uncomfortable and I was about to cry. So I grabbed my empty cup and I went to go walk into the kitchen to um, get some water. Cause in my mind, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to move. If I have to cry. I'm going to do it in there because if I cry in here, it's going to become a seven day fight and he's going to make me feel worse. And he's going to say mean things. And, you know, I'm going to, he's going to tell me that I'm unreasonable and then not talk to me for a while. And as soon as I walked out of the room, like I didn't say anything, I wasn't stomping, nothing. He just stormed up out of the bed and he, he grabbed his work clothes for the next day and he grabbed his keys and he just started saying, I don't need this bullshit. 
I don't need any of this shit. This is ridiculous. And I was like, what, what did I do? Like, what, what just happened? I'm just going to get water. And he's like, oh, you're upset about something again. And I just don't need this shit. And, and he took his house key off his ring and he set it on the counter. And he said, you told me if I leave again, I have to leave my key. And I said, yeah, that's right. You don't get to just walk out and come back in at will. Like this is, it's not fair to me. And it's certainly not fair to your child. Like you can't do this. And I was like begging him not to go. Cause I was just like, I don't know what's happening. I don't know why this escalated. I don't know. This isn't how this has to be. And I said, can we just sleep in separate rooms and talk about this tomorrow? And he was just yelling at me. And then my daughter woke up and I picked her up. And he just kept yelling at me and, and I covered her ears and I, and I screamed at him the word stop. And then he just looked at me and he, he looked so disgusted. And he said, you just screamed with your child in your arms. And I said, but you were just yelling at us. Like I covered her ears. Um, And so he walked out. And I still was trying to text him and ask him, you know, what's going on? About 1230 at night, he said, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I'm going to sleep in my car and find somewhere to live tomorrow. Um, So the next day, you know, my daughter asked if daddy was coming home. And I said, not to this house. Daddy's not going to live here anymore. Like, you know, she cried. Um, He... We, it was about three days before Mother's Day and about a week before we were supposed to go on a trip to Cabo that I had bought for his 50th birthday present. Um, He talked me into going to brunch with him and the kids on Mother's Day. And I remember I was just so devastated. And then looking back, I could see how he just kept poking at me. You know, at the time, I, I still wasn't everything for what it was. And I remember getting up. I couldn't eat. I got up and I went and threw up in the bathroom. And then he gave me grief for being dramatic and, you know, not being able to just enjoy a nice thing that he's doing for me. Um, And then he went on the trip to Cabo. He still went on it and he took spending money my dad had given him for his birthday. And like, I was just so crushed. I was like, I can't believe this is like, like, why did I give two more years to this? Um, But when he got back from Cabo, he was you know, he'd done a lot of thinking there and, you know, he really, his family means a lot and he doesn't really want to throw it away and he really wants to make it work. And I was still very trauma bonded and like that, that physical, just that heavy physical pain of the loss. Um, And so I said, well, we can try, but you can't move in and we have to have a set schedule of when you take our daughter for time so that she knows when that's going to be. I said, you need to spend two nights a week having dinner with us here as a family so that that connection still stays a little bit, but you know, we're going to live in different places and you're going to have to go back to solo therapy. And, um, and I said, I was going to do that too, because I had, I had gotten a promotion at work and I was like, okay, we can swing, can swing this. And this is what we need. Um, so of course I set that all in motion. He really bucked having like a set schedule because, you know, what if he's tired and what if this, and what if that, and I was like, that's not how parenting is. Like, I don't come home and say, I'm too tired to take care of her. Like, that's not how this goes. Um, and in that time that lasted only four months that felt really (laughs) like four years. Um, you know, I was, I started seeing a new therapist and in that space, it became very clear that, you know, when you have to say these things out loud, that it, you can hear the ridiculousness of it, of like, well, I just don't want to destroy her family. And it's like, well, her family's destroyed. Like this isn't, this isn't really a family. Um, you know, and my therapist kept going, why are you, why are you holding on so tight? Why? And you know, I said, I I have to try everything so that when I look at my daughter later and say that I did everything I could to save her family, that I know that that's the truth. I know that that's what I did. 
Um, and the part I didn't speak out loud for the first two months of therapy was I also was, was more than low level terrified what he was going to be like when I wasn't any good to him anymore. Um, when I had to finally draw the line and, and I didn't want to say that to myself because I didn't want to be the person who was scared to leave somebody. So they stayed with them. What that, you know, meant about who I thought I was, was, was more devastating, I think, than anything else. Um, so with, with my therapist sort of in slow motion and not calling it that until the last month, I was, I was, you know, creating an escape plan. And during that time, because of the, the not living together, I really was able to slowly chip away at that trauma bond. And I could see that when he wasn't there, the house was really calm and that, you know, there were normal toddler things and, you know, my daughter was four. So there, you know, it's not that it was quiet, but there was just a lack of tension in the air that, that felt so refreshing because it had been eight years of just being in tension all the time without even realizing how much, how much. And then he would, when he would come over for his dinner nights, the weather would just change in the house and he would just start complaining about things. And of course, you know, the entirety of our relationship, I was critical. I always complained. You can't ever be happy. Nothing is right for you. And you just have to find the negative. You're so negative and you're so angry. And having that space without him and then having him re-enter it for short periods, I was like, wow, that's, that's you. Like, that's you. And he would come in and he would complain immediately about the dogs or he'd complain immediately that it was hot. And can I turn a fan on? And, you know, it was like just always this like small list of like grievances and he would, you know, maybe not show up because he was tired or like one night he was supposed to take our daughter. And I said, Hey, are you going to be here soon? And he said, Oh, I'm tired and hungry. I just went home. And I'm like, so you're not going to see her and you're going to be gone for work the next two days. And he's like, yeah. And so I could see that like his priorities clearly weren't what I had kept wanting them to be and kept trying to pretend they were. And I could see that he was, he was the issue. I, you know, I knew that deep down. I knew that it wasn't me. I had even, I had even, um, in the middle of the worst part of all the figuring everything out and all the lies, he kept telling me how angry it was. I had even emailed my ex, the one I'd been with for 13 years and said, you've seen me through the best of times and the hardest of times. Like, I need your honest answer. Would you say I'm an angry person? And she was like, no, like, you know, and she said, you know, you could be critical of this or you could, you know, she gave a list of things that I was like, yeah, those. Okay. Yep. 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 Okay. Those things. But, but not angry at the same time he started because he would always have some kind of obsession with some number of females online or something. And, and at this point, one of them was a 23 year old bikini barista in our like sort of larger geographic area. And I was so disgusted by it because I was like, you're this 50 year old man that she wouldn't want to have anything to do with. You're supposed to be working on your family. Supposedly you don't have an issue with, you know, needing all this attention, but you know, you have to keep commenting on her posts and I'm sure you're going to get coffee there or, you know, I'm like, and it just seemed so pathetic to me that, that I think that was the final straw where it broke the trauma bond. And I was just, I started to be repulsed. And so one night he also, I had given him a key a couple weeks before, maybe a month before, because I, I was volunteering at an overnight um, fundraiser and needed him to stay with our daughter. Well, he ended up taking her to his house and leaving the animals all alone anyway. And we had a fight about that. And I was, you know, so unreasonable. And all he did was go to his aunt's house or his sister's house. And, um, but he didn't give me the key back. And I remember having this like 
anxiety about that. Because and then instead of knocking or instead of me needing to leave a door open for him, he would just come in the front door like when he lived there. And I was already starting to just like say out loud that I needed, I needed an exit plan and I needed it. I needed to have it be rock solid so that there was less um, chaos. And I remember the night, like I had seen him, some message came up that looked like it was from her. And I was like, are you are you so pathetic? You're being catfished by a 23 year old barista and you don't even think that's what it is. Like, it was just this like surreal, like, I can't believe this is the person I like tied myself to for so long. And, um, so I waited till he was snoring. And then I, I remember really quietly grabbing the key, his key ring and going in the bathroom and taking my key off of it and putting his key ring back. And then I think it was a week or two later that I said something to him about the barista. I had told him for a whole weekend that I needed space and that I needed to not have him message me or anything because I was trying to wrap my head around it. And then Sunday, he he messaged and said, you know, I went to so-and-so's kid's birthday party and I missed you guys so much. And my family is so important and I'm really going to focus on the family. And And I just told him what I'd been feeling about him doing this and that it looked like they'd been messaging and I just couldn't do that anymore. And then he just flipped and started accusing me of like doing all this weird stuff through his um, Instagram. And he was doing this thing where he kept saying, it was just in text, but he was like, you have 24 hours to admit this. And if you admit it, I'll still love you. But if you don't admit it, then we're over. Like, 5 p.m. tomorrow we're over if you can't admit it and I just said I'll just save you the time like we're just done and then he just railed like it was just like a a a switch flipped and he told me um I had achieved mega cunt status and he you know he was gonna he was gonna get 50 percent custody and I wasn't gonna be able to keep him from doing whatever he wanted and and I just said you don't call me don't text me. You have my email. Like you just do that. Um, but that is when, you know, that that's when I, I just built such a wall and I'm so grateful that I was able to have that time. There was a lot of time I felt bad for trying again after he had walked out, but I think that it was so crucial to me being able to end it and keep my faculties about me so that I could say, yeah, we're, everything's in writing. I, I know this is what I have to do. I don't miss you. I don't want you. I don't, you know, I just have to focus on this child. Um, so that's when like, you know, it was just a 180. like I was no good to him anymore. And so he, He had a, I asked him, I gave him a deadline for picking up stuff he'd left in the building for six months now that I had moved out to the garage. And he posted online that his landlord was keeping him from his things and stole his key. And could anybody help him get his barbecue? He can see it, but he's not allowed on the property. And a tenant's rights lawyer met with him pro bono and was like emailing me. And I was like, dude, you don't, this guy's lying. (laughs) But it was just that level of harassment where it was like, you know, he was, he refused to show up. I had a name change court date because one of my daughter's middle names, I, I figured out had come from conversations with the woman he had an affair with. And I wanted that name off her birth certificate. And he was like, I'm not doing that for you anymore. And, um, he filed three three false harassment claims against me at work. Um, He was refusing to, you know, we were in that pre-court order time. He was refusing to confirm drop-off time for, I I had set a schedule that was like staggering up so that my daughter had a transition into spending more time away from home. And so he wouldn't have visitations for whole days because he would only confirm pickup time. But I had a suspicion, which was later confirmed that, he had kidnapped his son around the same age during the divorce proceeding with his wife. And he did that. It was two or three weeks. He kept the child away from her. And so 
you know, he was calling the police on me. He was leaving notes on the front door, bringing his son and saying, look, she told me they'd be here and they're not here. He was leaving notes on my front door. I live in a business district that were like three paper towels with Sharpie written on them and like red duct tape on my door. Like, so they were giant so that you could read them across from across the street saying that I, you know, didn't have his daughter there and they, and daddy misses you. Um, you know, the same guy who will chant like all cops are bastards with his punk rock friends was like going to the police department to report me or calling the police to my house. And, you know, because I didn't answer my phone. Um, it was just, you know, at that point that I was like, okay, this is, this isn't normal. Like, this isn't just like somebody who's like heartbroken. Like, what is this? And that's when I first started you know, learning about emotional abuse in that way. I think, you know, I definitely had that stereotype that certainly a lot of us who grew up in the eighties have of like the sort of loud, drunk, you know, physical abuser, but not this like covert um, chameleon kind of manipulative thing and so it took a long time like even with my therapist like I would call it the a word at first instead of abuse like I just couldn't say it and it was like I'm not I'm not someone who was abused right like how do I you know how do I weave that into my my own perception of myself and how do I come to understand that like I stayed with someone and kept going back to someone who you know, was doing all of this stuff and who now I can clearly see is just cruel. Like he's just mean, like, and has no qualms about, you know, hurting his child in order to hurt me. Like, so I just have to figure out how to protect myself and, and protect this child who, you know, definitely doesn't deserve what you put your son through definitely doesn't deserve what you're gearing up to to really unleash on her so how did things work at work um so yeah I, you know he he was still working with me which was tricky then he was filing these harassment claims and it's interesting because we had to it's a family business so we had to have an outside company do the investigation right like my uncle's HR and my dad owns the company like we can't um and that woman she asked another manager you know I didn't I had to really sort of keep separate I just tried really hard to stay away to keep really clear lines so that I didn't jeopardize the company um but after she talked to him and he gave her all his complaints about what I was doing and singling him out and harassing him at work. And um, she asked another manager, she goes, see, is this guy a drunk? Like, what is up with him? And I was like, yeah, see, you think you're, <laughs> sounds so sane to people, but when you really start ranting, well, you know, she, cause she hears all kinds of stuff, but you know, that came back as not founded. And then he tried a couple more times. And the third time he actually got, um, reprimanded because he'd basically gone to a manager with personal emails between us and had complained about those. And so, you know, he was clearly bringing personal stuff to work and, and he ended up, um, being laid off in the beginning of COVID. And in that time we had had two court dates had what I thought was our, you know, final court order, which is funny because, you know, anybody who's been through family court, um, at least here in the States, like there is no such thing as a final custody court order because it's basically up for change at any, at any point. Um, but we had had a, our first hearing in December, um, and it was really rough. He submitted a lot of not nice and not true things in his declaration, but the court did adopt basically what I had set as a schedule. And I think, again, that's where that summer where we were trying to make it work, I had sort of inadvertently set a status quo. So he ended up with what was basically 11 or 12% custody because I mimicked what he actually spent with her even when we were together. Um, And I held off overnights. So they set, I said, I don't think she's ready. And 
she, you know, she had a nine hour visit with him early on and she would not leave my side or let me let go of her hand for three days. Like, you know, it was, it was really intense for her. And so then overnight started the week before COVID lockdowns and then COVID happened. And, you know, he had, he had been harassing the whole time with the notes and the police and, you know, doing all of that. But I thought when I have this court order, you know, now I have this. And one of the officers, it's really interesting. The first officer he had call me, I had gone away from the house knowing he might show up and then he'd gone to the police department. And I remember I was in a home, Home Depot parking lot to buy a Christmas tree. And the police called me and I said, that's not what's going on. Here's what's going on. All I'm asking him to do is confirm drop off. Um, we have about 70 emails this week and he just keeps refusing. I said, I would have been happy to give her, but I don't have any grounds to get her back if I don't have something in writing. And he goes, can I give you a piece of advice? And I said, yeah. <laughs> I was like, please throw me anything because I'm drowning here. And, and he said, when you get a court order, don't bend for this guy at all. Don't bend for him. He goes, you will undermine what that court order means. And this guy will push. So you need to not do that. And I, I am thankful to that officer to this day, because there are so many people in, in the police force, in family court who, who really minimize, um, how important it is with, with somebody who is abusive, with somebody who, you know, I mean, I believe, I, I believe he's a sociopath. Um, you know, with someone who doesn't have a moral compass and doesn't have a conscience about any of this, that like, you can't bend, like you just end up then back in that cycle. You have to just keep such firm boundaries. And, and so I was doing that, but then COVID happened, he got laid off, which was a blessing, but like I hid out at home that day because I had no idea what he would do because no matter the truth, like I only found out because I had to prepare the checks. I didn't know he was on the chopping block. I didn't know any of that. You know, I was so removed from his um, employment, but I was terrified. I had an iPad in my window ready to record in case I needed to call the police with my phone. Like I was like, I don't know what this guy's going to do. And, and Seemingly, it went pretty smoothly, but what happened is three days later, well, he sent a really, you know, sweet message because, you know, they'll send like these scathing attacks and then these like really sweet message in between asking if he could just watch her while I work because, you know, he's unemployed now, so he could watch her and, you know, he, it won't be instead of his weekends. So basically he was going to, I was going to end up having her for like five waking hours a week. If that's what happened, <laughs> like, it was funny. I was like, you're not even trading. I was like, how are you going to find a job? Like, but I said, I was going to follow the court order as written, which was one of my pat answers. Right. Cause I'm like, no, my daughter is like starting to freak out about these overnights. I can't send her to you more. Like this isn't good for her. So three days later I got, I got noticed that he'd filed an ex parte emergency um, petition against me for neglect because I had started to bring my daughter to work with me during COVID because she, she had had two, I'd hired private nannies for three days a week um, when schools closed down because I had to work. And so I was taking her, you know, I was actually, I think I was doing five days at first. The first two, they both quit because as soon as overnight started, um, my daughter started having rage fits. Like she would just have these episodes when she was home where she was just inconsolable, kicking, screaming, like, you know, just all the emotions were coming out in that way. And so two people quit. And so I started bringing her to work and he, so he filed a neglect charge against me. That was two hearings over like four months. Um, he did not win that one. Um, and in hindsight, I think that my case was really helped by him filing that because family court sees, they see true, like terrible neglect, right? So for him to say, and then I could show pictures of my private office and her working on her alphabet and watching Netflix with her stuffed animals, like on the couch, it's not, it's not neglect. Um, 
So I think at that point, some things turned for me in the eyes of the family court because it was clear that there was one person acting nefariously and one person really trying to take care of a child. Um, so those hearings ended. He ended up with um, like a vacation clause was the only thing he won. And then I ended up with medical and educational decision making because he showed himself to not be capable of being either cooperative or putting her first. And so that felt like a win. I was like, okay, well, that was an expensive win, but at least I got through this. And, um, you know, every, every week, every week, there was something where he was messing with her head. He was telling her I was lying about certain things. Like one time she came home and said, daddy said, you have gray hair and you dye it and you lie to me about it. And it was, you know, six months into COVID. So I, I actually have dyed my hair most of my adult life. But I said, well, I, I don't, I, I don't lie about it. I dye my hair. I said, but you can see right here, like I have a little bit of gray, you know, and she just freaked out and just like, it was one of those moments where I just saw cognitive dissonance, like at work, because she either had to believe him and I'm a liar or she has to believe me. And then he's a liar who's lying about me. Right. And she just couldn't, she just walked out of the room. She said, can we not talk about it? And I was like, yes, we cannot talk about it. Um, he sent an iPod home in her underwear one day. He like, she would come home with these like weird bruises and scratches. Like, you know, I don't think he was, I don't think he was laying hands on her, but it was like, his room was a mess and she would trip over. Like, like she'd say she hit something metal in his room and weird stuff like that. She, um, he, he had her the night of her preschool graduation and he knew about it and I got her ready for it and was going to go there. And I went there and he never showed up, but he, he lied and told her that it was later in the night and that I was going to take her so that when she got dropped off, um, I had to tell her it, she'd missed it. She just collapsed to the ground and cried and he just smirked at his car because, you know, that was just going to crush me that, you know, she, he wanted to make her mad at me. Um, he would just do stuff like that all the time. Um, you know, we had a COVID exposure. And so when I messaged him and then his response was to attack me over not telling him faster, you know, that all that stuff where it's like, clearly you're not concerned about your daughter. Um, we actually had COVID at one point. So I had messaged him and I was panicked about how he was going to react. And we switched weekends and then because I didn't answer my phone, he pounded on our door for 30 minutes and I asked him to leave and, or I'd call the police. So he called the police and it was this whole ordeal where they were trying to get me to just like, let her go see him. And I'm like, this isn't what you think. Like, none of this is what you think. Like, cause he did that raging at my door for 30 minutes and then stepped back and just was calm, you know, and was just the like worried father. And she's just, I don't know why she's keeping her from me. Um, three officers, I had to talk to three officers in my backyard about that for like an hour. And the, then a couple years out, he actually, he was late for a pickup and I had a 30 minute clause and I just, I bailed because once it was 31 minutes, I knew if he showed up, then he was going to make a scene. And he pulled up as I was pulling out and he chased us through two towns um, was trying to get me like run us off the road and he would get me over to the curb and then he would get out of the car. Like he was going to grab her out of the car. And then as soon as he'd get out of the car, I'd go again. And I was on the phone with the police and I would honk as soon as he got out of his car so that anybody in the area would like be looking at us. My daughter's screaming. He's trying to get her to walk across like three lanes of traffic to go to his car. Um, at a red light, he got next to us and he punched the car twice on the side she was on um, and called me a fucking bitch. And, you know, she's screaming. And, and then I finally flagged down a police officer, followed him and was flashing my lights. And so they pulled over. But And so then he got in line behind me and was all like calm again. And I was like, here we go. Here's, you know, sad dad. And you know, the police let us go somewhere where he, cause he was trying to just stare at us while he was getting talked to. And then he tried to still talk to us as they were making him leave. And 
um, an officer stood between us and then they, they followed us mostly home. But I, you know, from that incident, I, I filed another petition with the court because I was like, I don't know what to do because when he came to the door, it was only a month earlier, he'd been pounding on the door and the police had been so dismissive of it. I, I had told the officers, I said, I think he's going to escalate because you guys are acting like he didn't do anything wrong. Um, and then he escalated and I said, I can't do nothing. Like this is, this is terrifying. Like my child is terrified and I was terrified. Um, and I kept having, you know, through those years, I kept having to face that there'd be things that happen in custody disputes, quote unquote, where you're like, well, he wouldn't do that. And then you have to go, well, I don't know if he wouldn't do that because he's done these 42 other things that I never thought he would have done. And he's done those things. Um, so in that filing, I actually ended up with sole legal and physical custody. Um, his ex-wife gave a declaration for me, um, outlining that he did all the same things to her when they split so that he could no longer keep saying that he co-parents fine with her and the problem is me. Um, he was put on supervised visitation in order to do 52 weeks of anger management in addition to like a parenting and a co-parenting class. Um, and he has yet to do any of that. So we haven't had visitation in just over two years now, which, you know, is, is a relief, but it's one of those things that is such a sad thing to have to need you know, to have to protect your child from another parent is, it was a win in court, but it's one of those wins that you wish you never, ever needed. Um, you know, she, she understands, like, she'll bring up every once in a while, like, remember when daddy did this to the car and she'll, you know, fake punch or, um, she'll be like, remember when daddy used to always call you a liar or, you know, remember when daddy didn't take me to graduation and she'll be like, I'm still mad about that. Um, but she also misses daddy. And, you know, we have a plan. She asked me, I want to say maybe six months ago, like, what would happen if we ran into him? And I said, well, it would be up to you. Like, if you want to say hi to daddy, you could say hi to daddy. But I mean, you can't go with him. You know why you can't go with him, right? She's like, yeah. But then when we brought it up with her therapist, it turned out she was also just afraid she wouldn't want to talk to him. And she wouldn't know what to do. So we have a safe word now where if we did run into him in our town, if she said that, I would know that meant she didn't want to talk to daddy. And then I would, you know, be the bad guy and just kind of steer her away from the situation. So, you know, we're, we're luckier than a lot of parents because we have some real protections in place. And the judge actually even put parameters for what he'd have to do to even try to file again. But it's, you know, it's a, it's a bitter pill to, to have this kind of parentage when it's not what you wanted. And how's your healing process going? That has been, um, you know, a lot, a lot more than I expected. I think that there was a part of me in the beginning that was like, okay, I, you know, the biggest issue is reconciling how I stayed in this so long and figuring out how to trust again, myself and other people. Um, but through the process, you know, I'm seeing so much from my childhood differently now than I used to and um, sort of recognizing patterns and things that seemed normal to me that in the light of, you know, post-abuse, as well as, you know, in parenting and, and remembering things that were said or done and, and not being able to imagine saying or doing those things to my child. Like, you know, I would have never said, oh, I had an abusive childhood or I had a terrible childhood. And I, I still don't think I had a terrible childhood. I think that my parents loved me. I think that neither of them were sociopaths or, you know, abusive in that way. But you know, there's definitely sort of elements of neglect or of minimizing and gaslighting and, you know, of being told you're too sensitive or too dramatic and, you know, having all of those feelings dismissed that 
that create an environment where you tolerate someone else doing that for a lot longer than if, you know, that wasn't a part of how your whole family sort of spoke about you or did things. So, you know, I still, I am almost four years out now. And at this point, I am really happy being single. And I'm not, closed off to the idea, but I really, um, I just, I don't need it at this point. And I know that, you know, when I meet somebody, it's going to bring up all kinds of other issues, you know, trying to trust someone again, that will mean some more really deep healing. Um, but, you know, I, I started writing around the time overnight started, I started a, a an anonymous blog and it was to get through the post-separation abuse because it's such madness and nobody understands it and you can't possibly explain it to people in the way that it happens because it's such, you know, the thousand cuts and the, it's so many small things. And um, so writing has been really important to my healing and I'm working on a, a memoir project that right now its goal is to just really make sense of how it feels to be in that to sort of know it's not okay, but how disorienting and sort of paralyzed you feel um, in the middle of all of that. So that's been, you know, I've, I am finally healed enough that I'm going back and able to sit in moments of being with him, you know, the important moments from that. So that's that's been really helpful. So I think, you know, finishing that project will be good. And if you had any words of wisdom for everyone listening, what would they be? Oh my gosh. Um, so I think, you know, one of the things that I, I hope to teach my daughter and that I think is such a, such an important message that I certainly didn't, didn't get from culture, media, my family, whatever is, is that idea of that's that sort of fairy tale love, um, that rapid connection, that um, chemistry in that way, right? That a lot of a lot of folks now will talk about what we call chemistry in romantic relationships is really just being like an activation of some sort of anxiety about a past um, way we were treated or some sort of dynamic like that. But I think if I had slowed down, if I had not bought into um, that soulmate kind of connection. If I had not also been so geared towards, you know, when you know, you know, kind of thing that um, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have been a good target for him because I would have, he would have lost interest. Um, you know, and the, I, I think just really not, projecting your own morals, ethics, um, intentions on other people, because it took a long time. It took until after I ended it for me to be able to accept that he, he would do these things just to hurt us. You know, that just seemed so unfathomable to me. Um, cause I would never do that intentionally. So I think, you know, taking it slow, letting someone show themselves before you invest too much. Um, you know, the, the words matching actions is, is so important, but I also, I think that there is so much about how we behave in these relationships that we feel shame for, that we keep ourselves in them because we're so, we're so afraid of exposing that, of being embarrassed, of admitting or having to admit to the the ways that we behaved unlike how we see ourselves that you know I really try to stress with people that to just let go of that shame like who we were in that is not who we are like that that we were we were being poked at constantly and you know that of course we are going to act out just like a cornered animal so you know, to just let go of that shame and accept that what you did is what you did to survive. 
Well, Avery, we are done. And you did a really good job today. And you just did a really good job conveying your story and really letting people share a big part of your life and your pain. And hopefully, you know, and I know uh, there's going to be someone out there who's going to learn from what you said today, be validated and maneuver themselves out of a relationship because of you. So I can't thank you enough for being here with us today. Thank you. Thank you for giving uh, so, so many people voices in this. So thank you so much, Avery, for being here with us today. And if you want to be a guest like Avery was today, please do go to NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. There you can read all of our instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send it in the format that we ask for. And if you are in need of support, we have a support group at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, you'll see a support group button. When you click on that button, it takes you to our very own safe social network. Inside, you'll see that we have Zoom meetings every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoons, and Saturday nights. We also have forum boards for you to post on to get the validation that you need from survivors just like you, and you can do the exact same thing for them. It is a wonderful group of people on there, and you can share your experiences and make friends as well. So if you need support, join our support group today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. At DomesticShelters.org, they have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you are dealing with. They have every phone number, email address, and web address for shelters and agencies, no matter how big or small the town you are in. DomesticShelters.org has it there. It is a wonderful free resource and a wonderful organization. So if you need extra support, please do go to DomesticShelters.org. And we here at Narcissist Apocalypse have a new friend to the show, and it is an organization called Shelter Movers, which you can reach at sheltermovers.com. And Shelter Movers helps survivors of domestic violence transition to a better and safer life. They are currently a Canadian company, but looking to be spreading in the United States. It's a volunteer organization and a donor-supported charitable organization as well. And what they do is they help coordinate moves for those who are getting out of domestic violence. They do the move with you, and then they also put things into storage for you. All of your belongings can go into storage, and they do this for your pets and livestock as well. They find homes for them, and it's just a wonderful organization. So if you need help from them or just want to donate to them, please go to sheltermovers.com and check them out. And that is it for our show today. So for myself and Avery... We hope you have a good night.